Today on Not Sam Wrestling, CM Punk drops the promo that we've been waiting for. We come off of NXT deadline. Adam Copeland and Christian went one-on-one. And what is rule number three? This is Not Sam Wrestling. As we say, welcome to Not Sam Wrestling. I realize, you know, and I'm already starting to think about it. We are very close. What, like a couple of weeks? Yeah, two weeks maybe away from uh, starting to put together our list of all the madness that went down in, in 2023. I can't wait to do the 2023 recap podcast because we will be doing a 2023 recap show where we also kind of assess who did the year belong to, who's maybe the MVP of the year, who's the most improved of the year, stuff like that. We're also going to be doing a podcast where we predict uh, 2024, uh, I'm almost forgetting what year we're in here. Uh, as we did last year, I think if you go back and look at the 2023 predictions, I would say 100% of them were wrong. Uh, uh, somewhere between 99 and 100% of the predictions were wrong, but they were fun. And we'll see, I mean, <laughs> based on the where we were with the build to WrestleMania and where we are now. Although I think I predicted that Cody would not win the title at WrestleMania. I don't know. You'll have to go back and check, but it'll be fun regardless. As we look into 2024, before we uh, sink our teeth into everything we're going to be talking about here, we there's a big announcement. Start the show. Big announcement. We are going to be doing a live Not Sam Wrestling show. It's back. We haven't done one since SummerSlam in Detroit, but this Royal Rumble weekend, unless everything falls apart within the next two days, we will be doing a live Not Sam Wrestling in Tampa. Uh, tickets are not on sale yet. They will be on sale later this week. Uh, everything will be made official later this week. I would hope we will have an, another Not Sam Wrestling show, an interview with Baron Corbin coming up on Wednesday. I would hope by that Wednesday drop, I can give you all the details of how you can get tickets. But as of now, just just be ready for Royal Rumble weekend and for Not Sam Wrestling to be a part of it in Tampa. And boy, we are already headed in the direction of the Royal Rumble. When the scoop was broken that the Royal Rumble would have two months of build, which anybody with a calendar probably could have figured out that scoop. Uh, Little did we know how true it would be because yes, we've already got one entrant official. We got another uh, person teasing that he may be an entrant. And of course, I'm talking about CM Punk. It wouldn't be not Sam Wrestling if we weren't starting the show with this week in CM Punk. And uh, regardless of, of of this week in CM Punk, it has nothing to do with this. But is this a nice sweatshirt? Did you guys notice the sweatshirt that I was wearing? Did you did you see this? Did, did you, I mean, I, I just found it. It was just clean in the laundry, and I thought today would be a good day uh, to wear this uh, uh, Roots of Fight pink Bret Hart hoodie. Did anybody else? I mean, is there any context for it that I'm not aware of? It's just a clean sweatshirt. That's all. Just a clean sweatshirt. Another person who's wearing a clean sweatshirt this weekend was, of course, uh, CM Punk. He showed up at NXT Deadline. We'll talk about uh, everything that happened at NXT Deadline, but he opened the show uh, with a promo that was not... Uh, I, it was not... Uh, the uh, meaty SmackDown promo. It was more just uh, Punk getting to get in the ring, have a little bit of fun, tease that you never know where he's going to end up, uh, and hopefully get some eyes on the NXT product, which I think is a really cool thing that he did that. I mean, it's everything about it is so surreal still. The fact that on on Saturday morning, I woke up and, and saw Instagram posts of CM Punk outside of the new WWE HQ in front of the, you know, person-sized Undisputed Universal Championship, uh, working out in the new WWE gym with the WWE logo behind him. And then I hosted the pre-show for Deadline. And uh, since Deadline was in Bridgeport and the pre-show was in Stanford, it's only 20 minutes away. So I decided to drive down to Bridgeport so I could check out the show live. And going backstage and... Seeing CM Punk in a WWE arena was so cool. I mean, so 
cool to see him there uh, and get to say hi to him again. And I mean, you know, it's not a, it's not an act. The guy was having a good time. The guy was in good spirits. It was just really, it was really, really awesome. But to me, the most awesome part there, I mean, there was, look, the moment when he was in there, right? And he goes, there's always a line. Even when you're like, okay, that was what it was. There's always a line. In the first promo on Raw, it was that one little thing to camera when he was done. I'm not here to make friends. I'm here to make money. Got everybody talking, right? On NXT, it and this was off clearly off the cuff. When Shawn Michaels referenced the Bret Hart hoodie that CM Punk was, I guess this is the same Bret Hart hoodie that CM Punk was wearing. Who would have thought? Uh, when, Bre when Shawn Michaels referenced that, and CM Punk said uh, something to the effect of, no, 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 I thought that was all water under the bridge. You guys made up. Hey, me and Triple H made up. Anything is possible. I was like, oh my God. Great. Great stuff. Loved that Sean referenced it. Loved that, you know, everything is on the up and up. And this is the key point. Everybody seems to be having fun. I think the reason why WWE is fun to watch right now is because the people that are making it are having fun. It just seems like everybody's having a good time doing what they're doing for the most part, right? In sort of a broad stroke thing. And it seems like that's where we're at with CM Punk. I've found that what I've really loved in the, what is it now? Well, one, two, three, four times so far that we've seen CM Punk on television is that he's made it so, especially as of SmackDown, he hasn't lost his his essence as a stirrer of trouble, I'll say. But also, I feel as though even people that were like, I don't know, I don't know about this punk guy coming back into WWE, WWE's good, is he gonna mess things up? Is he gonna be good for the locker room? That narrative has been silenced. Because what Punk has effectively done, at least for me, from my perspective as a fan and somebody that was a CM Punk fan for a long time, loved CM Punk and Ring of Honor, very quickly became my favorite WWE wrestler at the time that he was wrestling in WWE, like just a big fan of that character. I feel like this run for CM Punk so far has been less about, you know, the podcasts and the backstage controversies and the real life beef and the getting fired on the wedding day and this and that and all this stuff that I feel like while it made Punk a bigger star because he was more controversial, it also, and we saw this in AEW, muddied the ability to tell real stories and it, and it muddied the ability to just get lost in this character because as a fan, you're thinking about all this stuff that you really shouldn't be thinking about. As a fan, we're sitting there thinking about, yeah, but you know, he wasn't nice to that guy or this guy hates him and I like this guy, so I don't like that. It's like we, we're supposed to be getting lost in these characters and because we're so aware of so much behind the scenes controversy, it's become impossible to get lost in this character. I think that's why during Punk's second or third run, I guess, in AEW, it was the third run, right? the collision run, the final run in AEW, it became impossible to get into any of the stories that that character was telling because we all became so aware of the stuff that happened, whatever it was, a year before that at All Out. And then had to develop a segment called This Week in CM Punk because every single week it was a new story about some other behind the scenes controversy, whether it was real or fake, that wasn't relating to the stories being told on screen. So what we're getting now with this version of CM Punk so far to me has been this ability to remember that he was your favorite wrestler, to get lost in the character again. To, 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 to feel that thing that you felt when it was CM Punk versus John Cena, when, when, when CM Punk started rising through the ranks of ECW, when CM Punk won the Money in the Bank match, when all these things happened, that, that, that it was like, you know, like WrestleMania 29, for example, like I don't think that 
I think that the narrative that Punk wanted to main event WrestleMania and therefore the Undertaker match was not exactly what he wanted, that became a narrative that people were far more aware of after the fact. And leading up to that Undertaker match, we were able to just get lost in this great story that was told and CM Punk throwing Paul Bearer's ashes and coming out in the gray trunks with the purple stars on them and, and, and telling a story. And people got lost in that story. And that's the CM Punk that I think wrestling fans want. And that's the CM Punk that wrestling fans are getting. It's a really interesting time in the WWE because for, uh, and in wrestling in general, because I think for a long time, people got so used to quote unquote wrestling. And I also feel like if you looked around, it didn't seem like a new audience was sort of repopulating what was going on in wrestling, that it was us same fans that have been there for the beginning watching it. I don't remember a time in recent, you know, in the last 20 years where I've met more people that are new wrestling fans than right now. But I think what's happened is, and why WWE is so successful right now, is because wrestling fans are ready for wrestling. We just want it to feel like pro wrestling. We want to watch wrestling matches. This is why LA Knight got so popular because it was like, well, I don't know, this LA Knight, he just seems like a wrestler to me. Yeah, that's what we want. Wrestlers acting like wrestlers having wrestling matches with consequences that wrestlers would face. That's why we're watching. We don't need to disguise it as something else. We don't need to forget that we're watching wrestling. We don't need to bring in people to trick people into watching wrestling and making them think it's something else. We just want it to be a wrestling show. And that's what it is. And and CM Punk came out on SmackDown and he kept the essence of CM Punk and he kept the controversy going, but ultimately he cut a wrestling promo. And he cut a wrestling promo by calling people out, some by name and some specifically not by name. But it made you excited for the potential of matches that you're actually going to see. It made you excited because we're seeing seeds laid for a story that we will be able to experience and see the culmination of. It's not rocket science. That's what wrestling is. We want to know that we can get excited about this thing that is starting right now because we're going to get to see the culmination and the payoff because this already is a ride that sounds like one I'd like to take and I can have the faith that we're actually going to get to take it. That's wrestling. And that's what we're getting here. So CM Punk comes out uh, on SmackDown at the top of the nine o'clock hour. And the reason that I know it was the top of the nine o'clock hour, I mean, okay. When we're noting how that punk promo went, right? When we're going down everything that happened in that CM Punk promo, it actually starts before he even makes a sound, before he touches a microphone. Nine o'clock Eastern, top of the second hour, cult of personality starts playing. And here comes CM Punk. And he's got a t-shirt on that says, hell, froze over with the punk logo in the O. And what's the first notable thing that he does? He greets the fans on his way. And one of the great members of the WWE universe has a uh, world heavyweight championship replica on his shoulder. And punk makes note of it. Punk looks at the title. He looks at it almost longingly. He looks at it like, oh, that might be something to get for myself. And he looks at the camera as if to acknowledge like, yeah, I'm thinking what you're thinking I'm thinking. And then he goes to the ring and already seeds, seeds, seeds being planted. Who is the one holding that title right now? Well, of course, the guy that called him a hypocrite on Monday Night Raw, Seth Rollins. So CM Punk, he goes to the ring and already, by the way, you're looking at it. They, they put the whole thing up on YouTube doing tremendous numbers. It's, it's like a third longer, I think. I think the Raw promo was like eight minutes. This one was like 12 and change. And he gets in there, and the first thing that he says is that he was going on at the top of the nine o'clock hour. 
And you know what that means. I'm not going on last, which means they're not going to cut my time so you can cheer all you want. And right there in that one sentence addresses anyone that was critical about the fact that that Raw promo that we watched was short, that we waited three hours to watch a short Raw promo. Well, guess what? They and CM Punk is all about they. That's one of the things that everybody's got a they. There's always a they. They're making you do something. They're on your ass. They're a nuisance. They're bossing you around. They, we're all dealing with a they. And CM Punk's they is the one that cut his time, apparently on Monday Night Raw, and now we're gonna get the promo. People at Survivor Series when he came out and he got cheered, they go, well, of course he's gonna get cheered in Chicago. Of course he's gonna get cheered in Chicago. I'm not sure he's gonna get cheered elsewhere. Well, let me tell you something. Where were they? Rhode Island, I want to say, at the tribute to the Troop Smackdown. He had no trouble getting cheered there either. CM Punk is not going to get booed for being there. CM Punk will get booed for if he's doing certain character work, if people like the guy that he's facing better than not. But WWE fans, they'll say whatever they want on the internet. They're not, I mean, you can look at the way merchandise is moving. You can look, there's a, there's a great Twitter account called Wrestle Ticks, I want to say. You can look at how many tickets are sold to events. Every single event, they put them up there. And you can see numerically the difference CM Punk makes in tickets. It's, it, I don't know, is he going to get cheered or boot? He's literally selling tickets. So he brings up the promo. He makes reference to the fact that his time is not going to get cut. And we go, okay, this, here we go. It's almost like you heard, you heard this, you heard us. I'm not going to have to come on this podcast and go, yeah, I know it wasn't what we wanted, but here are the positives. No, 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 no. This is the one you've been waiting for. So he starts talking about Raw and SmackDown. And it's always very interesting to me that uh, Randy Orton, they kind of did this with Randy Orton too, that there's a loyalty that the audience is expected to have. And for some reason it works. So for some reason... If you buy tickets to SmackDown and people go, you want me to stay on SmackDown? Everybody goes, yeah, as if they're going to be at the show next week. You're not going to SmackDown next week. And if Raw had been in town instead of SmackDown, you would have gone to Raw. Who watches SmackDown or Raw exclusively? But whatever, it works. It gets the reaction. And I love the fact that we've got authority figures that are now competing with each other. I think it's an, uh, ultimately a good thing. It just is a little ironic. Um then he asked the question that got the real reaction. Because I think people realize, like, yeah, we'll cheer for SmackDown because we're here. But, well, I don't really have any vested interest in SmackDown. But then he says this. Do you want me to throw 29 superstars over the top rope and go to WrestleMania? That's where he gets the reaction. Because this is the first time we've gotten a tease of CM Punk actually competing in a WWE ring. It also tells us a lot about the potential Seth Rollins CM Punk match that we're all waiting for, which is what I was hoping. CM Punk is teasing competing in the Royal Rumble. And I think CM Punk competing in the Royal Rumble is the move, right? It'll it it makes it so that CM Punk does not have to carry an entire lengthy match as his first uh uh, uh premium live event experience it makes it so you have cm punk interacting with multiple superstars right that this first time we're seeing him in the ring in his gear wrestling again not only do we get to go in wondering i don't know is cm punk gonna win the royal rumble is cody rhodes gonna win the royal rumble is la knight gonna win is is, is aj styles gonna win the royal rumble but we get to see him interacting with people who maybe he doesn't even have we get to see him yes interacting with somebody like a cody rhodes Yes, interacting with somebody like a Kevin Owens, potentially. But also, guys like Kofi Kingston. Guys like uh, Grayson Waller. You know what I mean? Like, there's 29 other guys. And and who knows? Who was the star of last year's Royal Rumble? Are we going to see CM Punk and Gunther interact with each other? Hey, forgive my interruption, but if you're getting a gift for somebody that you love for the holidays, you don't want to get them a paper poster. They shred, they wrinkle, they're terrible. Instead... Get them art. Get them a display. Displates, listen, it's a metal poster. But not only is it a metal poster, it's a metal poster that has these amazing magnets. 
So it allows you to stick them up in no time and you can switch them out as you please. So see, like, this is my disc plate. I got this because it's like wrestling, it's Nintendo. It's got all my interests all in there, but they've got everything over on this site, right? You can get Star Wars, Marvel, Stranger Things. They got cool landscapes. They got man cave designs. They got maps of your favorite cities. That's why it's so awesome that you can switch them out because once you get one of these for somebody, they're gonna wanna keep coming back and back and back. Get them hooked on disc plates and you can save like 30%. Yeah, I'm not kidding. Save up to 30% when you click the link in the show notes. Discount will be automatically applied to your cart when you click the link, or you can use code NOTSAM when you visit Displate.com. That's Displate.com, code NOTSAM, or click the show notes. The possibilities, I would say, are endless, but they are capped at 29 other superstars. However, he teases being in the Royal Rumble to start, and we're like, okay, here's we go. Here we go. Now we start mentioning names. Brings up Cody Rhodes. All good with Cody. Cody's an old friend who welcomed him back with open arms. Okay. Uses his line. What do you want to talk about? But says he and Cody are good. Okay, good to know. He and Cody are good. He says, who do you want me to talk about? It's not what do you want. Who do you want me to talk about? I don't know what the audience was saying, but Punk goes right for it. He says a guy who's not here and apparently is never here. Roman Reigns, whoa! Now, with Roman Reigns gone, we've gone from a, a situation where after WrestleMania, there was a conversation about who is left for Roman to even face, right? Like, like after he beat Cody, it's like, well, wh what possible challenger would Roman have now? Well, since Roman's been gone, since Crown Jewel, We've got LA Knight looking for another opportunity. We've got Randy Orton gunning for him. And now we've got CM Punk gunning for him. And what does CM Punk say? Congratulations for everything that you've accomplished. But don't forget, I am the OG Paul Heyman guy. And before he was your wise man, he was mine. And you go, whoa. Now we've got a story. Now I have argued that... Roman Reigns is not a Paul Heyman guy. Paul Heyman is a Roman Reigns guy, but Paul Heyman has has evolved with every major client that he's had. But that evolution, that evolution beyond manager starts with CM Punk. The modern day Paul Heyman as an associate starts with CM Punk, goes to Brock Lesnar, goes to Roman Reigns. I understand that there are certain people between that, you know, Ryback or 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 or, or uh, Curtis Axel or whatever, but but really, those are the, the, the those are the steps that get us to modern day Paul Heyman. And CM Punk puts it right out there, flat. Takes a little shot at Solo Sokoa. Takes a little shot at saying, oh, "I could either beat up Jimmy Uso or I could hang with Jey Uso." Okay, all right. Got some real baby face feelings going on here. He goes, who else? What are, can I get? He, go, he asks, and, and there's the main event tonight. You know, he brings up Jay and so, uh, Jimmy and Solo. He goes, the main event tonight. What about those guys? He's, he asks the question, can I trust Randy Orton? Would Randy Orton even want to tag with me? I got history with him. And you go back, the worst WrestleMania of all time was WrestleMania 27. But one of the few good things on that card, really two good matches at WrestleMania 27. One, Undertaker versus Triple H. Two, Randy Orton versus CM Punk. He goes, one guy I know, I think would tag with me is LA Knight. And, and you know, you get the cheer, you get the reaction, but realistically, I and I've said this, I think, two weeks in a row now. This is like the third week. I can't wait until we see real interaction with LA Knight and CM Punk because based on these characters, the LA Knight character should not want to team with CM Punk at all. I didn't get the feeling that the LA Knight character was feeling great about teaming with John Cena. I think he'd rather go do his own thing. I didn't get the sense that the LA Knight character was feeling great about teaming with Randy Orton. In fact, it's, he seemed annoyed that Randy got the cover. He wants to do his own thing. LA Knight wants, the whole thing is that he wants all the spotlight 
on him. He's worked this long not to be a rookie that's taken under the wings of legends, but to be an instant legend, to take it all for himself and take out anybody that's slowing him down. So there's a very interesting dynamic there, but it gets way more interesting because he brings up Kevin Owens. And Kevin Owens is one of those names that has come up of of of, of people that uh, we wrestling fans who have an internet connection are not sure whether or not Kevin Owens and CM Punk are in good standings right now. And he brings up Kevin Owens and he says he's prickly. I could tag with him, I could fight him. He says he's prickly. He says that's a compliment. That's to say Kevin Owens and I are a, a lot alike. But he says... I don't know, because I've been watching Kevin Owens and he randomly punches people in the face backstage. He's got a little smirk on his face. All of us at home already start typing our tweets. Oh my God, he's talking about beating people up backstage. And Punk goes, it's 2023, man. You can't be doing stuff like that. And all of us on the internet are losing our minds. Interestingly, the live crowd didn't react much to that line. And I think that that goes to show you how casually a lot of WWE fans watch the product. That that these are people that probably will, might watch SmackDown every single week, might watch Raw every single week. Like people who are active enough fans that they bought tickets to go see SmackDown on a Friday night. But there's a good chance that a lot of people in the audience and a lot of casual WWE fans that are excited to see CM Punk because WWE does such a good job of hyping up these big moments, right? You'd have to not have a pulse to not think that that moment at Survivor Series was huge. Even if it's the first time you've ever seen CM Punk, you know this is massive. And you turn on Raw the next night and the way they're hyping up this promo, whether you think the promo is great or not, you know this is a massive star. I wouldn't be shocked if there are people in the audience of that SmackDown that they didn't even get that he was talking about some weird backstage AEW controversy because as much as us, hardcore wrestling fans, are waiting for these references and some of us are making it up when it's not even there. We're like pinpointing, maybe he used this word when he said, I'm, I'm here to, I'm not here to make money. I'm here to make friends or whatever. <laughs> Strike that, reverse it. I'm not here to make uh, friends. I'm here to make money. There are people going, he's talking about the bucks. He's talking about the young bucks. You know, we love it. We love those references. And so I was freaking out. I told my wife, you hear what he said? She was like, okay. <laughs> I was like, oh, all right. But maybe there are more people there that are like my wife than are like us that are going like, yeah, this is a good, this is fun. This is a good promo. I'd love to see Kevin Owens versus CM Punk. No, but did you hear what he said about the other thing? I don't care about the other thing. I'm I'm a wrestling fan who wants to watch wrestling. I don't I don't I don't need, you know, the Vanderpump rules version of it. Let's just see where the story goes. Okay, Sam? I go, oh, all right, all right. Well, we'll get back to the promo then. He says there's one bad apple though. He brings up Seth Rollins, but interestingly, Seth Rollins is the only superstar that when he's going through this list of potential friends and enemies, he won't even mention by name. He uh, refers to Seth Rollins as the bad apple, and he says, I'm not even going to talk about him, and it's not because of his whiny voice. It's because he's not even the man in his own household, and you go, whoa! Whoa, we are firing live rounds now, Phil. My God. <laughs> Obviously bringing up the fact that uh, 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 Becky Lynch is the man married to Seth Rollins and, and, and has, has a child with Seth Rollins, his, his wife. But maybe CM Punk is inferring she's the, the breadwinner of the two. I don't know, but I think the real shot came across the bow when the fans started singing the Seth Rollins song and Punk goes, keep singing. That's just about the only thing that he's got. All he's got is that song was what he said. And it's like, whoa, <laughs> that's a shot. That's a real shot. I loved it. I loved it. 
He gets back into saying that he's so glad that he's back home, right? He's almost emphasizing the word home. Oh, you don't like it when I say this is my home? Well, guess where I am? I'm home. It's almost like if you don't like it, if you don't like that this is my home because you don't like what I said before I was here, tough, I'm home. I'm Rick James laying on your couch with my muddy shoes. And now it's my couch. He says uh, uh, he's going to make his decision on Monday as far as which brand he signs to. He does a hell of a Heartbreak Kid impression. Maybe he'll sign to NXT. And then he says on Monday he'll go to Cleveland. References the fact that it's the same town that he walked out on this place in. So now, okay, now another reference. We're referencing directly the fact that, hey, what happened the first time you were here? Oh, I walked out of this place. I was over it. So we're not hiding that. We're not pretending that never happened, which is crucial, I think. He says he's going to make his decision on Monday as to, as, to, as to where he ends up. But in the meantime, the one thing that all of the people that he mentioned have in common is that CM Punk is back and he's the monkey wrench in all of their plans and their future goals. And then, I mean... I got all kinds of goosebumps when he goes, I'm going, I'm here because I've got one thing to do. I'm here to finish my story. And finishing my story means going to the Royal Rumble, winning. And then he says this, and main eventing WrestleMania. And he drops the mic and you go, oh, he did it. He did it. This is what it has been. He just brought it all full circle. At WrestleMania 29, CM Punk was not happy in real life to be in the Undertaker match. Why? Not because he didn't want to be in the Undertaker match, but because he wanted to main event WrestleMania. And people said, Punk, you're crazy. It's the Undertaker match. The main event is whatever it ends up being. You're in the Undertaker match. People are going to talk about this forever. It's the first Undertaker match post the four that he had with Sean and Sean and Hunter and Hunter. Yeah, but I don't want that. I want a main event WrestleMania. And then he tells the real life story on a pod, on Colts podcast where he goes uh, uh, that the plan for WrestleMania 30 so nuts, by the way. WrestleMania 29, he wrestles The Undertaker. WrestleMania 30, which ends up being Yeslemania, which who knows what on earth that would have looked like had CM Punk stayed around. Because WrestleMania 30 was Triple H versus Daniel Bryan. And if Daniel Bryan beat Triple H in the first match of WrestleMania, he could go to the main event and wrestle that triple threat match. But apparently the original plan was for CM Punk and Triple H to have a WrestleMania match. CM Punk was feuding with the authority at the time, but Punk didn't want to do it. Why? He wanted to main event WrestleMania. It wasn't enough to do Punk versus Orton. I think 28 was Punk versus Jericho. 29 was Punk versus Undertaker. 30 would have been Punk versus Hunter, but we didn't get to 30. Because Punk wanted to main event WrestleMania. And if you go back, if you go way back in the way, way back machine and you look up on YouTube and you find the interview that I did with CM Punk a couple of days before his match with The Undertaker, I interviewed CM Punk at WrestleMania 29 Radio Row. And you can hear it in him. I mean, it's of all the times I spoke with CM Punk on a microphone, I think that was my favorite one. Because I felt like I just got him in the right moment. He and I were, were, we were connecting. We were having a real conversation. And in hindsight, knowing what we know now, you can hear a lot in that conversation about how he's feeling going into that match with The Undertaker. That is all being referenced when he says, I'm here to finish my story and main event WrestleMania. Because 10 years ago, he was wanting to main event WrestleMania and he left. And now 
10 years later, he's back to go to Philadelphia to main event WrestleMania. Now, the other thing that we've got there is the guy that he talked about being on good terms with, Cody Rhodes. He specifically used Cody Rhodes' words and said, I'm here to finish my story. So you know what he's saying? I don't give a damn about you finishing your story, Cody. I'm here to finish my story. And as it turns out, my story gets in the way with you finishing your story. And you know what that means? You ain't finishing yours because I'm doing mine. All of that in one little sentence. Maybe I overanalyze, but I got it all and I loved it. Loved it, loved it, loved it. And then they uh, they continued on with Punk throughout the night. Post nine o'clock, SmackDown belonged to CM Punk. The first superstar that he goes face to face with in his return. This is history, ladies and gentlemen. The first superstar that CM Punk goes face to face with is Kevin Owens. That's the first one-on-one -on -one direct interaction that he's had with a superstar since returning to WWE. And they look at each other and there's a tension and Punk asks if he knows where Nick Aldis' dressing room is. And Kevin Owens just goes, no. <laughs> Which is, I mean, so brilliant. Just good writing. You know, no, I'm not going to help you, dude. Nope, I don't know where it is. How do you not know where the general manager's office is? You work on SmackDown. Yeah, I don't know, dude. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know where it is. He goes, okay, thanks for the help. And that was it. Enough said. And then later on in the night, Punk goes in, gets his contract from Nick Aldis. Nick Aldis says he's got some place to be. Where do you got to be when CM Punk is in your office? But regardless, Nick Aldis powders and Cody Rhodes shows up. Cody Rhodes was, of course, on SmackDown because it was tribute to the troops. He wanted to, uh, to send a shout out to the troops, which I loved him doing. And uh, he said, uh, uh, I heard uh, that uh, you're gonna have to win the Royal Rumble to finish your story. Punk said, yep. Cody said, that's interesting. Puts out his hand, shakes his hand. He just says, that's interesting. Okay. And I go, yeah, it is interesting. Because we got two guys with the same goal. And then, of course, one more time later on in the evening, Punk just shows up and can, and just, just says what's up to Randy Orton and LA Knight. So now we've got Punk cutting the Punk promo we've been waiting for and interacting with Kevin Owens, Nick Aldis, LA Knight, Randy Orton, and Cody Rhodes. It's a beautiful time. It's a beautiful time to be watching the product. Um, I think the conclusion that a lot of people are jumping to, which may be right, I'm not saying that this is a bad thing to do, is that you're, you'll have two WrestleMania main events because WrestleMania is two nights. Roman Reigns versus uh, Cody Rhodes, and Seth Rollins versus CM Punk. Those are your two WrestleMania main events. Um, and I think that that is probably what will happen. I think that's the most likely thing. I, you know, I think a lot of people are probably going to pretend that they never said, I think it's going to be Austin and Punk. They would just forget that that never happened because <laughs> it doesn't make sense anymore. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it'll be, uh, I think it'll be, uh, uh, Punk and Rollins and, and and Roman and Cody. It's just, the question is, how do you get there? Because the thing about long-term storytelling is a lot of times you can figure out where it's going because it's logically, there's one place for it to go. And Triple H tells very logical stories. So you can, you can usually kind of figure out where they're going, but it doesn't matter because they're a fun ride. And they go where they should go. They go in the most satisfying spot. So while you know where they're going, you're also happy about where they've gone, if that makes any sense whatsoever. Um, I think the, the number one, we shouldn't pigeonhole ourselves as we're fantasy booking into just the most obvious answer, right? Because if we're not going to, if we're not going to go beyond this idea of these are your two main events and that way everything's settled, we're not speculating wildly. And that's a sin when it comes to not Sam wrestling. That's rule number two is to speculate wildly. Um, you know, I think that uh, uh, a lot could happen. 
That's what's so great about this. A lot could happen. I think that you also have to wonder, are we going to get to a place where we can convince the world that CM Punk versus Seth Rollins is night two? Right, and then does that end up with Cody not being happy about Punk taking night two? Does Punk insist on night two as part of the storyline, right? Does, does all of that count? Or is night one and night two, like do you look at WrestleMania, you know, 39 and go, well, Cody Rhodes and Roman Reigns main evented that show, as did the Usos and Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn. Do you go to 38 and go, well, Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar main evented that show, as did Kevin Owens and Stone Cold Steve Austin. Look, I think most people do in the sense that if you go, what was the main event for WrestleMania, night one of WrestleMania 39? Yeah, Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn versus the Usos. Everybody knows that. But if you go, what was the main event for WrestleMania 39? You're going to the Sunday show. You're going to the last match, right? Like technically, yeah, there are two main events because there are two nights. But if you take the two nights as one thing, the main event of night two becomes your main event. So does that come into play? Or is that something that doesn't come into play this year, but maybe gets brought up next year? Can we wait a whole year? What if... What if Cody doesn't beat Roman? What if he holds the title for another year? And what if we don't get Roman versus Punk until night two of WrestleMania 41? It's all possible, man. And that's when Punk finally gets, and, and you know, you also have to figure out where the crowd is at that moment. Are they following him all the way to WrestleMania 41? Is he the guy that they want to see that happen for? Or is there... Somebody else, somebody newer, somebody fresher, somebody whatever. Is he a heel by then? If you're sitting here predicting WrestleMania 41, when we can't even really get a firm grip on WrestleMania 40, you're out of your mind. But I love it because you're speculating wildly. And I think it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Hey, uh, I wanted to talk uh, about, uh, you know, internet uh, reporting, Okay. I think it needs to be done a little bit more responsibly for my own benefit because I say I'm not going to, I always say this, I'm not going to get tricked again. I'm not going to get tricked again. Oh, everybody knows this is happening. The WWE is going to be sold. It wasn't sold. Remember that night? We all thought the WWE was already sold. It hadn't been sold. It wasn't going to be sold for, you know, months. But because everybody on Twitter said so, it must be true. You see it repeated uh, uh, enough times, it must be true. And none of us, Learn our lessons. On Friday, everywhere I go, on Facebook, I keep getting the memes. On on Twitter, I keep seeing it pop up. Happy birthday, Michael Cole. On Friday, everybody online is saying happy birthday to Michael Cole. Wrestling news sites. These accounts that say wrestle news, wrestling news, whatever news, boots and tights news, Squared Circle News, Everything News, Grapple News, Slam Bang News. And I go, well, of all these news organizations. And so you know what I did? Because I'm a good guy. I texted Michael Cole. I go, uh, I go, uh, I'll read it to you. I go, hey, man, uh, thanks for, oh, here it is. Happy birthday, dude. Thank you for everything. I got a text back. Question mark. LOL. Not my birthday, but thanks. It wasn't Michael Cole's birthday. Why you keep putting on the internet that it's the guy's birthday? It wasn't his birthday. I'm going to take this to the grave with me. Anytime you tell me the internet says this is happening in wrestling, I'll go, the internet also told me it was Michael Cole's birthday. I wish the guy a happy birthday. He goes, what the hell are you talking about, dude? It's not his birthday. You wrote everywhere it was his birthday. If you have a wrestling site that said it was Michael Cole's birthday on Friday, you have no credibility. That's not true. I'm here to tell the world. It wasn't his birthday. And I got to get a, a text back from him. Can you imagine? Can you imagine somebody you know 
texts you on some random day, just a random day, and goes, happy birthday. And you go, what are you talking about? I can't imagine how weird that would be. If somebody that I know, somebody that I know, texts me in like the middle of June and goes, yo, happy birthday, my man. I go, oh, I didn't realize I was dealing with a total idiot. It's not my birthday. Why would you text that to me? But I'm not the one calling somebody a total idiot. I am the idiot. Why? Because I'm reading through and it's like, oh, wrestle news, squared circle, whatever. Figure four news, full Nelson news, the ankle lock news, collar and elbow news, leg drop news. RK News, Tombstone Pile Driver News, Sweet Chin Music Weekly. They're all telling me, Sweet Chin Music Weekly wishes Michael Cole a happy birthday. I, wow, Sweet Chin Music Weekly is wishing this guy a happy birthday. Who am I? I better let the guy know. I appreciate him. And what's he right back to me? What are you, a total idiot? Maybe we need to take you off the NXT pre-show. It's not my birthday. Oh, you believe the internet, huh? You Mark, I go, oh no, he didn't write that, but that's how I felt he felt. And I deserved it because I read the internet again. And this show's on the internet. The internet's important to all of us, but please, for the love of God, take a little bit of responsibility. There's no way that that news report was checked and double checked. You know how I know that? It wasn't his birthday. I digress. Regardless of, uh, I felt like it was my birthday on Saturday. Why? Because Deadline was so freaking good. NXT Deadline, NXT pulls out another amazing premium live event. Uh, Deadline was great. The the highlights, uh, now Dom losing the North American Championship. I wasn't uh, necessarily surprised by it. I thought it was time, uh, not because, I mean, Dominic Mysterio is my favorite wrestler. So not because of anything Dominic was doing, but because the Judgment Day story is getting uh, so detailed on Raw that I felt like Dominic being the North American champion while Judgment Day was just kind of running everything made a lot of sense. But Dominic being North American champion while Judgment Day is kind of figuring things out amongst themselves, it gets a little wonky because now you're showing up on NXT and it's like, you got a lot of Judgment Day business to take care of, my man. I don't know if you should be over here. So uh, Dominic loses the title to Dragon Lee. Um, I would imagine this would be a short reign for Dragon Lee. I, I would think that Dragon Lee's brother, Wesley, was supposed to win the match, uh, but they brought in Dragon Lee instead because obviously Wesley is injured, unfortunately. Um, and so I would think that, that they're like, look, we'll put the title on Dragon Lee and then we'll figure out a plan of action within the next week or so. And then maybe maybe New Year's Evil will be the good time to drop that title, right? Like New Year's Evil already, it's gonna be a banger of a show. Already we know we've got uh, uh, Blair Davenport versus Lyra uh, Valkyria for the Women's Championship. And then we're gonna get Ilya Dragunov versus Trick Williams for the NXT Men's Championship. So if we also figure out, you know, I don't know, who would be a good North American champion it might be a good time for that Dijak might be the right call to make there you know Dijak and then Eddie Thorpe could chase Dijak for the North American championship it would just be nice for Dijak to get a little something unless you put it on Corbin you could definitely put it on Corbin and have him kind of go on a reign of terror a little bit as the North American champion because I'm ready for Corbin to start winning some serious matches um who, by the way, uh, Wednesday, uh, Corbin was in the Not Sam studio the night before deadline. So that interview will drop uh, Wednesday of this week on the YouTube feed as well as the audio feed um, and early on Patreon. Uh, but yeah, so we got uh, Dom losing the North American Championship. Cora Jade returning, which makes things very, very interesting because now you've got this title match set up. But Cora Jade is like, I'm back for one reason and one reason only. I think it's a good thing because we got Vengeance Day in February, which means Blair Davenport, Lyra Valkyria. I would imagine Lyra will retain against Blair and then Cora Jade will come after her at Vengeance Day 
uh, for the title. And then if Cora Jade beats Lyra Valkyria at Vengeance Day, then maybe stand and deliver, we get Roxanne Perez and Cora Jade one-on-one, -on -one, maybe like an Iron Man match, maybe a, some kind of step, I don't know. But he, uh, Cora Jade defending the title against Roxanne Perez is a pretty good match for stand and deliver. Uh, Ah, uh, the I was expecting it, but I'm glad that it went down the way it went down. The Pillman twist, Lexus King trying to distance himself from being a Pillman, but still acting like a Pillman. The fact that he manipulated the situation that he was in just so he could get a little premium live event rub. This guy shows up a month ago and all of a sudden is in an arena with 5,000 plus people in it, live on Peacock against the former NXT champion. How'd he do that? Well, he manipulated the situation. Uh, I uh, thought uh, that the Corbin match was really, really good. Corbin and Ilya. If you really look at that match, the physicality that went on uh, was kind of nuts. And I got to see, see, it, see it live. I drove from Stanford to Bridgeport to watch it. And uh, I mean, when those guys started uh, hitting each other, when they were going blow for blow, it was not like a fun wrestling chop fest. It was two guys knocking the you-know-what out of each other. Ilya hits hard, and Baron Corbin hits hard back. Uh, so I thought I thought it was a lot of fun. To me, the standout, both uh, Iron Survivor challenges were great, the men's and the women's. The women's, I think, gave a spotlight to uh, a lot of women that haven't had that opportunity yet. But man... That men's Iron Survivor Challenge was one to write home about. Just the the timing of it. And when you think about it, the fact that, like, everybody in that match, save for maybe Tyler Bate, who's had a lot of experience, but everybody else has accelerated so quickly in that NXT system that they were able to pull off what they were able to pull off. I loved Braun Breaker coming in uh, and, and Dijek, too. Dijek's had a lot of experience. Uh, I love Braun Breaker coming in and just instantly getting his three falls, just chopping everybody up and just destroying people to get his three falls. Uh, I thought it was really a, a great moment when uh, Dijak, I think, was beating up, I want to say, Briggs in the penalty box and Tyler Bate was begging them to let him out and he was just everybody was getting crushed because they were all in there at the same time. But the really impressive moment of that thing was seeing a uh, uh, trick pull off the timing of that end and watching the crowd go with him. It's so great to hear. Like they, they are so behind Trick Williams and they should be. But watching this guy first get that fall over Dijak, do the spot with Tyler Bate timed perfectly so he could get the fall and still have time to hit Braun Breaker at just the right moment so he could get the cover with two seconds to spare and then grab those three falls at the very last second to win the match and get his title shot. Uh, awesome. Awesome. Now, is he going to win the title? I feel like the move would be to have... Carmelo turn on trick at New Year's Evil cost him the title. Do Carmelo and trick at Vengeance Day and then have trick get another opportunity at the title at Stand and Deliver and potentially have Trick Williams win the NXT Championship at Stand and Deliver as that sort of NXT version of WrestleMania moment. That, I think... Uh, would probably be the way I would go. But it was a great show. If you haven't seen it, check it out. That brand is just so on fire right now. It's so cool to see them doing so well. Uh, over on the AEW side of things, uh, you had Copeland versus Christian. Adam Copeland and Christian had their match on Dynamite. Ended in interference from uh, Nick Wayne's mom, Shanna Wayne, who apparently, even after everything that Christian has said about her late husband, her son herself, she's just simply found him irresistible. Christian is, is too good of a father for Shauna to not be on his side. I mean, I hope 
And, and I was not, I was, I loved the way this turned out. I figured that there would be some kind of chicanery involved. You know, I didn't think that this was the Adam Copeland Christian match. I think we're still going to get a Christian Cage Adam Copeland match at uh, uh, World's End. I think that would be the spot to do it. Um, but I mean, I just, the idea of Christian as a father and a disruptor of families is so much fun. I love it so much. He's doing so well in that position. I think long-term, the idea of Nick Wayne eventually turning on Christian and having him be a baby face while his mom stays on Christian's side is amazing because then you've got a baby face chasing a heel who's intimately involved with your mom, which you tell me a better story. I'm waiting. Explain to me how it gets better than that. I think in the short term, what are we going to do? Because I think instantly when you get women involved and you get significant others involved, you start looking for a Beth Phoenix appearance, right? Instantly you go for, let's do a mixed tag. Let's get Beth Phoenix in there. We, we you know, saw it. People wanted it with Miz and Maurice. People wanted it with Seth and Becky. People love a, a, an Adam Copeland, Beth, I guess it'd be Beth Copeland now. Beth Phoenix is such a cool name. But uh, people want an Adam and Beth tag team. They always do. I don't think this is the one for it because I think people still want that Edge Christian match. I think that the move has got to be a cage match, right? I, I think a lumberjack match, there just aren't that many. When you hear it's going to be a lumberjack match, there aren't that many great lumberjack matches. There's some great spots like that one time in the lumberjack match when Dean Ambrose jumped over all the lumberjacks to, to you know, start fighting in the crowd. That was fun. But like then you start thinking about the zombie lumberjack match, which is one of the worst things you could ever see in the industry. They're just not great. Cage matches are great. Cage matches are super fun. So I think I think that's what I would try to do. And I think that would be a big attraction too. At World's End, doing Adam Copeland versus Christian Cage, TNT Championship inside a steel cage. Or they could paint it white and put like, you know, church ornaments and stuff on it. And they could call it inside a Christian cage. That could be Christian cage in a Christian cage. No, okay. Maybe a little Vince Russo-ish, but still fun. Still fun. I'm just having a good time. I'm kidding. Um, yeah, I think uh, Edge, uh, I'm sorry, Adam Copeland and Christian in a cage would probably be where it would go for the pay-per-view because you want to know that you're going to get a winner. And then having Adam Copeland win and be TNT champion could be very interesting because now you've entered into a scenario where you're going to have interesting Adam Copeland matches against different opponents for the title. So that's cool. And then also on the AEW front, Apparently, Brian Danielson is just the dictator of all dictators. I mean, the stuff that you hear about what's happening backstage at AEW, as if anyone knows, when we don't even know what Michael Cole's birthday is, and we're going to assume that we know, I'm hearing, you know, Mike Mansuri fired this guy. I'm hearing Brian Danielson fired CM Punk. What are we talking about? How do you know? We, what are you talking about? I'm hearing Brian Danielson at one point was on uh, the disciplinary committee. At one point was the head of the disciplinary committee. At one point made the phone call himself. At what? So somehow word leaked out and it credited Daniel Bryan for firing CM Punk. Then some kind of word leaked out that Daniel, uh, that Brian Danielson is fining superstars for social media, for inappropriate social media tweets. If you have a bad tweet, Brian Danielson finds you. And, and the way it's phrased, it's almost as if it goes directly in Brian Danielson's pocket. He's the one who finds you and he gets a bonus. So he just sits there all day. Somebody who barely tweets himself, somebody who loves to read, somebody who doesn't even like the internet is sitting there reading tweets because it's how he makes his living because he finds people who tweet. Look, here's what all I'm saying. Brian Danielson, I think at some point has got to slow down in the ring, right? At some point, you can't wrestle Brian Dan Nobody can wrestle Brian Danielson style night in, night out forever. 
Brian Danielson is good at every aspect of sports entertainment, professional wrestling, whatever you want to call it, whether it's character work, whether it's matches, whether it's moves, whether it's promos, whether it's whatever. He's good at all of it. He's, he's, he can host a pre-show. He's good at all of it. I think he could be a baby face. He can be a heel. He can be the, 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 the underdog that everybody cheers for. He can be the guy that's fighting on the side of the planet because we all litter too much. Okay, he can do anything. He's the best. If I think uh, uh, you take Brian Danielson and after he loses, have him lose the Continental Classic and have that kind of be a point where you put a pause. Although I think he's wrestling Okada at some point in Japan. But like once this block of stuff is done, put a pause on Brian Danielson being the guy that just has amazing wrestling matches that everybody loves. And make him an administrative character. I would love it if Brian Danielson was on television, like, and somebody cuts a promo. Like, if if Edge tells uh, Christian, I'm sorry, if Adam Copeland tells Christian Cage to go F himself on television, then the next week we see Brian Danielson confront Adam Copeland and tell him he owes him $500. And, like, say, I need the 500 like have Brian Danielson just going around fining people, suspending people, being the law and order, being a right to censor. I think if anybody could pull it off, it's Brian Danielson. I would love it. And by the way, that stuff can work. Well, other than CM Punk stuff, my favorite part of the whole show on SmackDown was when Randy Orton uh, handed Nick Aldis a check. And Nick Aldis said, I only find you $50,000. This is $100,000. And Randy said, yeah, that's for next time. <laughs> He paid his fine in advance because he knows he's going to have to RKO that guy again. Brilliant. It's just funny. It's good writing. It's fun. Yeah, I think uh, I think that could be real fun. Uh, real quick news and notes because we're we're running behind. Um, I do want to say that uh, our truth amazing on the bump this week. We've never covered the bump. I don't think other than maybe when I've been on it on this show. But our truth between trying to get into the Judgment Day and the stuff he was doing on the bump running on all cylinders. He was on the bump with Jey Uso. And I don't know. Some internet sites are saying we got Yeet back, okay? I hope we did. I don't believe anything on the internet, though, because of the Michael Cole thing. Uh, TNA is partnering with Endeavor? Yes! The parent company of WWE, I think it's the same Endeavor. Endeavor Streaming, uh, they're powering the TNA Plus app with the relaunch of TNA, uh, I believe that they were also the company that uh, uh, did the back end for the WWE Network. So that's super cool. And, and we could speculate wildly on what uh, that could mean for TNA and their relationship with WWE, but we don't have time to speculate wildly. Uh, AJ Styles, still waiting for that AJ Styles comeback. Again, there were rumors that he was going to come back to SmackDown this week, but there were also rumors that it was Michael Cole's birthday. And uh, Charlotte, injured. That sucks for Charlotte, man. That's a real bummer. Uh, I don't know what the extent is. I don't know if she's going to be out of action. I don't know what exactly was injured, but it looked like she was injured pretty bad on SmackDown. So hopefully a very, very speedy recovery. Um, let's get into these emails, huh? Emails here, notsamwrestling at gmail.com is the email address. Don't forget to uh, keep up with everything that we're doing and make sure that you're paying attention to all social media as well as uh, any content that we're coming out here on the audio feed or on the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash notsamwrestling because uh, we will be announcing this week uh, where and when the Not Sam Wrestling live show will be happening, Royal Rumble weekend, okay? In Tampa, Royal Rumble weekend, not Sam Wrestling live podcast. They're always uh, amazing. We did one for WrestleMania last year. We did one for SummerSlam. Now we're back and we're starting with the Royal Rumble. Uh, and I can't wait. I can't wait to be out there with you guys again. Uh, all right, let's do it. Not Sam Wrestling at gmail.com. Not Sam Wrestling at gmail.com. Uh, Cade writes in. Sam, hope the family is well. Do you think LA Knight will win the title at the Royal Rumble and then lose it to Cody Rhodes at WrestleMania? Yeah, of course I do not. No, no, I do not think LA Knight will win the title at the Royal Rumble and then lose it to Cody Rhodes. No, the, I do not think the main event of WrestleMania 41 or 40 is going to be LA Knight versus Cody Rhodes. Number one, LA Knight's 
like the top baby face on SmackDown, other than maybe Randy Orton. So you're going to have him win the title, have this amazing moment where he beats Randy, uh, he beats Roman Reigns. He's the guy who gets to beat Roman Reigns. And then what? Turn him heel so that Cody Rhodes can then beat him? I mean, what, what? I don't, why? Why would you do that? How would that be good for anyone? If LA Knight beat Roman Reigns, and then Cody Rhodes beat LA Knight. It'd be terrible for everyone involved, all parties. Can you imagine like beating Roman Reigns for the title? And then that's like people who are like, well, Cody could have beaten Roman Reigns at WrestleMania. And then, uh, and then he could have, uh, Brock Lesnar could have challenged him for it. And it's like, well, he's not going to fight Brock Lesnar three times if he's not going to lose one of them. He's not going to beat Brock Lesnar just three times in a row. Brock could have won the title. So Cody Rhodes beats Roman Reigns and holds the title for one month and then loses it immediately. That's what we want. So LA Knight is the guy that finally beats Roman Reigns' record and then within 90 days, beat less than 45 days, Cody Rhodes just beats him? Come on. What is that? Oliver writes in, Sam, I was at Deadline this weekend. So was I. And as my first NXT Premium Live event, I was pleasantly surprised. Both at the show and you as pre-show analyst. Woo! I don't know why you were pleasantly surprised. I mean, I'm very good at that. You should have been. I was uh, adequately. My, ex my expectations were adequ adequately met by you as pre-show analyst. And the PLE left me pleasantly surprised. Um, it was my first time ever seeing Punk, which is absurd. When I was there, I noticed the biggest pops were for chants, like, whoop that trick, whoop that trick. I was laughing so hard listening to the crowd chanting whoop that trick, just thinking about that movie Hustle and Flow and, like, where we're at now with whoop that trick. It's so funny. Um, however, not many of the wrestlers had chants leading to minimal pops. My question is, how can wrestlers get a chant over with the crowd? It's, it's fun. It's just got to be something that's fun. Right? It's gotta it's gotta be a fun thing to do. Wadding people is like the funnest thing that you can do. That's why it's ruined so many segments. It's the second worst chant in wrestling. What? Second worst. But it's fun. So that's why it works. It just has to be something fun, you know? And it has to be organic. You can't you can't force it. Uh Kanjay writes in, what is your favorite Michael Cole line uh from this year? Mine is, do you believe in miracles for money in the bank? I mean, that's not a, that's not a Michael Cole call. That's from the Winter Olympics when the United States beat Russia. My favorite Michael Cole call from this year is uh, question mark, LOL, not my birthday, but thanks. That's That's my favorite one. Also, here's my World Heavyweight Championship fantasy booking for Rumble to WrestleMania. Okay, I'm listening. Drew beat Seth at the Rumble. Okay, big moment. Drew finally does it in front of a crowd. Then boom, Damien cashes in on Drew, giving Priest the star-making moment while also fueling Drew's rage uh, and extending his arc. Okay, while in the Rumble itself, the final four are Cody, Gunther, Sammy, and Punk. Okay, Gunther takes out Punk. Then Cody and Sammy team up to eliminate Gunther. So they're the final two after a 10 minute, 10 minutes is a long time. You're two minute back and forth. Sammy wins the Rumble. What? And on Raw, tells Cody to get Roman. Oh, because he's choosing the World Heavyweight Champion. Cody tells Sammy that he's proud and to finish his story at the Elimination Chamber. Damien retains against Drew with Judgment Day's help, of course. Sammy faces Finn or Dom. You... Sammy faces J Dom or JD on Raw. Damien retains against Seth and Drew out of desperation to save his moment. Cheats, beats Sammy and gets added to the... You're getting real complicated, dude. You're way overthinking this. So there you have it. Night one main event. Sammy wins the World Heavyweight Championship triple threat match. And you said two weeks ago, Sammy versus Damien at Backlash is France. Um. Yeah, but then what are you going to do? Punk versus... Rollins without the title. Now, after the SmackDown promo, here's the thing. After the SmackDown promo, you can't, Punk has to main event WrestleMania. Like, you can't not have that happen, right? Unless it's going to become like, 
Punk story. Yeah, I don't. That's very complicated, dude. It's very, very complicated. Um, let's see. Tim writes in. Uh, honestly, CM Punk came in and immediately tried to work an angle. Honestly, oh. I'm seeing people complain about the CM Punk smile tour, but in my opinion, WWE getting the nostalgia and courtesy pops out out of the way so Punk can fully jo Punk can fully join storylines and then avoid the edge half teary eyed stare from the crowd. In a, I don't know what you're talking about, Tim. You did not proofread your email. That was dumb. Um, Austin writes in. Sam, I think when it comes to the Mysterios, not enough people look at it from Dom's perspective. You know, I always look at it from Dom's perspective. Did you hear me on the NXT deadline pre-show? I said, it's not nepotism if your dad's a deadbeat. I believe it is Ray who has done him dirty. Well, Ray did Santos dirty. The first time we see Dom is as a kid and Ray is gambling his custody in a ladder match against Eddie Guerrero. That's not true because Eddie was saying he had custody. Eddie was saying that was his kid biologically. It was a wild time. He did not need to do it as he legally adopted him. This would be equivalent to me putting custody of my child on the line in a poker game. Uh, not unless you were real good at poker. I can't. Mm. Then Ray continues to miss Dom's childhood while he pursues his wrestling career, proving to be a deadbeat dad. Mm. When Dom has grown, Ray only brings him to WWE to help him. That's a stretch. Dom's first appearance as a superstar is trying to help Ray beat Brock Lesnar at Survivor Series. That's true. Ray used Dom to be the first father-son tag team champs. Yeah, but he got Dom a title. Ray and Dom beat the Judgment Day together at SummerSlam 2022, but when a rematch was scheduled to clash at the castle, Ray cast his own son aside to team with Edge. That is where you're starting to work. Ray embarrassed his son at WrestleMania by whooping him on the biggest stage of them all. You can't win that one. Look, here's the thing. I always like, you know, seeing it from the heel's point of view and doing that, but you can't just make up arguments and hit me with every single one because I'm looking at these logically and you can you can beat a lot of them only focus on the arguments that are ironclad and go yeah Ray has done some good things but also Ray did this also Ray picked Edge over Dom also Ray you know used Dom for that also you gotta you can't hit me with arguments that you can't win okay I'm not gonna accept them I have a high standard here on Not Sam Wrestling. That's the only reason. If I don't expect the best out of you, you're not going to give me the best. That's all. Ultra Boy, I remember last week uh, you went on a rant about how you hate Mount Rushmore emails because they're always subjective. Well, here's my object. I'm here's my objective NXT Mount Rushmore. Cool. I'm not reading it. Why would you write a uh, Mount Rushmore into this show? How much more clear could I have ever been about things I don't want? I'm not reading your Mount Rushmore. You can write in next week. Why you guys get me so fired up today? Hi, Sam. What's the haps? Big fan from the UK. This is coming from Dave. All right, Dave. Okay. All right. The bloodline storyline is the best thing I've seen in years. Okay. All right. All right. <sighs> Let me get back on a good in a good space. It got me hooked on wrestling again and love to see it continue. I think it's time Rikishi makes an appearance as his three sons have main event roles on Raw and SmackDown. We've heard uh, talk of the elders and Heyman uh, must uh, liaison uh, with someone else on the table as there's no other members of the family coming up the ranks, i.e. Jacob Fatu, Zilla Fatu, Ava Rain. Could he play like a mob boss type role? I, I don't think so. The problem is that Rikishi was like, Rikishi's the man, but like he was never head of the table. Rikishi's not Yokozuna. Rikishi's not Umaga. Rikishi's not like, Rikishi's the man. But if you look at Roman Reigns' career and you look at Rikishi's career, you know, that's why you, the elders are important, but you'd have to go to Sika. You'd have to go to Afa. You'd have to go to the real elders. So Rikishi, I, I would like to see Rikishi maybe come in but only if we're heading towards Jimmy versus Jay. If we're going to do Jimmy versus Jay at WrestleMania, then the idea of Rikishi coming in for a segment and like either trying to work things out or trying to get one of the two of them on the right path or 
you know, whatever it is, I'm all for it. I'm all for Rikishi. But the idea that Rikishi would be like Roman can't answer to Rikishi. All due respect to Rikishi. I love him. But Roman can't answer to Rikishi. Um, let's see. Nicholas writes in, your Pat Buck interview taught me all I needed to know about the job of a producer. It was great. Yeah, check that out. I think that a lot of us throw around these words because we read about them on the internet and we don't really know what they are. So Pat Buck uh, did an interview here in the Not Same Studio not too long ago. It's on the YouTube channel. And he kind of broke all that down. Just a suggestion, if you have the opportunity to do it, it would be super interesting to see the same thing about a television director on the show. The guy in the truck who has to orchestrate the camera work. Uh, they have to know uh, every wrestler's repertoire, I guess. Uh, they have to be some big wrestling fans. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, uh, obviously I know a ton of those people. Uh, it becomes a little bit of a conflict of interest when they're currently working to come and do a podcast and do, it gets a little weird. But uh, yeah, at some point, I'll definitely do that. I mean, Mike Mansuri has been on the podcast before. Before Mike Mansuri got, uh, after he left WWE and before he got hired by AEW, uh, he did a couple of things. I think we did a WrestleMania recap together a couple of years ago, but yeah, no, but I know what you mean. Like to go more in depth into that job. Uh, Raj, uh, from Queens. Hey, Sam Gunther and his intercontinental run, uh, has elevated the intercontinental championship back to its glory. I would argue that it is in a place that it has never been. At least nobody's had a run like this before with it. What do you think will benefit what do you think will benefit the most to, who do you think, I'm sorry, will benefit the most to overthrow Gunther when the time is right? Wild speculation, AJ Lee and CM Punk versus Seth and Becky at some point. Yeah, no, that's a good thing to wildly speculate about. And, you know, it's always mixed. But So CM Punk versus Seth, you can do without a defined heel or baby face. Just who do you like better? AJ Lee and CM Punk versus Seth and Becky gets a little wonky because one of those two tag teams has to really turn heel, which you could. I'm not saying you can't do that, but it, you couldn't do baby faces and baby faces in that mixed tag, I don't think. Who should overthrow Gunther if I had to pick right now? Um, well, I want to see him hold it to WrestleMania because I want Brock versus Gunther to be for the Intercontinental Championship at WrestleMania. Um... But beyond that, who should beat Gunther? Um, you know, uh, it's an interesting one because it would kind of have to be an underdog, right? Because people really like Gunther. Like you don't want LA Knight to beat Gunther because people really like both of those guys. You want LA Knight to beat like Logan Paul. So in terms of who should beat Gunther, it would have to be star making, right? It would have to be like who maybe it's, I don't know if there, it's almost like I, I would say somebody from NXT, but then is there anybody from NXT that, I mean, cause that's just such a huge rub to beat Gunther. Um, I'm actually scrolling through superstars right now. To see if anyone really, jumps out at me you know Braun Breaker might be interesting you know Bron Braun Breaker might be one to at least consider I don't know if he's ready for that run though I don't know if he's ready to capitalize on it you know what probably might be the move is to let let Chad Gable probably what I would advocate for if I'm just on the spot is letting Chad Gable have another go of it probably letting Gable have another match with Gunther and this time he actually wins like Gunther feuds with the Miz. Gunther has one more big match at 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 uh, uh, Elimination Chamber. Gunther faces Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania, and then maybe at the Raw after WrestleMania, Gunther faces Chad Gable after like having the most insane run ever, and then Chad Gable is able to beat Gunther on the Raw after WrestleMania. And that might be what I would do, or at least what I would. Uh, say could be a good idea. Um, Mike from Rhode Island. Sam, hope you and the family are doing well as the holidays approach. I really appreciate that, dude. My question for you is about Cody's road to WrestleMania. Do you think it'd be smart to make the Royal Rumble finish obvious with Cody winning? The other obvious option would have him winning the Elimination Chamber in Australia or 
Would you rather have Cody have a Kofi mania or WrestleMania type of road to WrestleMania as he tried to finish the story? Um, well, look, I don't think obvious is the right word because if Cody doesn't win the Royal Rumble, it still becomes obvious that he's going to find his way there. Um, I would like him to lose though. I mean, look, you know, if you've been listening to this show, the reason that, uh, the reason that I was in favor of Cody losing at WrestleMania is because I didn't think that he had had enough, uh, uh, enough roadblocks on his road to that match. I didn't think there had been enough in his way. I thought that if you looked at Cody Rhodes run in WWE, he beat Seth Rollins three times in a row in three great matches. WrestleMania had the biggest WrestleMania debut ever. Beat Seth Rollins, beat him again, goes to Hell in a Cell, has the most heroic moment ever with that torn peck. Beat Seth with a torn peck. He has to go away, but he goes away a hero. And then he comes back a hero by winning the Royal Rumble. And he's just like all, just everything is coming up Cody. And then the fact that he got to WrestleMania and lost is finally like, okay, this guy's going to have to work for it. And then the fact that he had to earn, like he got one lucky win over Brock, which people were mad that he didn't, like that he got one lucky win over Brock as if you don't understand how matches with three series work. And then Brock beat him. And then he finally is able to overcome the beast and it gets him to SummerSlam. And now we've got this spot where he's like a baby face. I, I mean, I, I do think that Cody going on almost a Shawn Michaels run when Shawn was going after The Undertaker for the second Shawn Undertaker match at 26, I, that might be the move for Cody to really make him work for it and put it in doubt. And, and it could be real interesting if you had Punk win the Rumble and then really make it seem like he's going to go after Roman Reigns. And then, you know, maybe Rollins loses the title at Royal Rumble or before and then wins the title back at the Elimination Chamber. And then after the Chamber, Punk says, I want Rollins. And then Cody has to just do something else to finally make his way back to WrestleMania. I'd like to see him struggle to get back to WrestleMania to answer that question. Yeah. And, and whether that means Punk winning the Rumble or not, I don't know. But I, I think a struggle would be good. Um. All right. Look, I've promised something. Uh, 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 I've promised that today on this show, I would tell you what the new third rule of not Sam wrestling is. And I feel like I've, I've had you wait long enough. And I've thought about this a lot, okay? The third rule of not Sam wrestling at one point was don't fantasy book Randy Orton, but now Randy Orton's back. You should fantasy book him until you're blue in the face. There are three things, three rules that you have to live by in order to be somebody that lives and dies by not Sam wrestling. This isn't a podcast that you listen to. This isn't a podcast that you watch. This is a podcast that you live and die by. Three rules. One, watch the product. Two, speculate wildly. And rule number three, everything counts. Everything counts. When we are talking about why things might be happening, when we are talking about motivations, when we're talking about all of it, everything counts. There's no, yeah, but that was just a thing over here. No, 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 no. Everything counts. Yeah, but that happened so long ago. No, 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 no. Everything counts. When CM Punk showed up to NXT in 2023 wearing a Bret Hart hoodie, even though that controversy is from November of 1997, Shawn Michaels made a comment about it. Why? Because everything counts. Drew McIntyre was clearly in the works with the Judgment Day. I saw him talking to Rhea Ripley in the background of, of, of promo segments. Why? Because everything counts. 
There's three things you got to do here on Not Sam Wrestling. You got to watch the product. You got to speculate wildly. And you got to know that everything counts. We'll see you on Wednesday for a big, massive, giant interview with Baron Corbin. Have a good one.